Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and at least get the intro going, get rolling. We'll make sure we have time for questions and Q&A. Uh, I'm Brett, for those who don't know me, I'm Brett Gorman. I'm the current director of coach education here at US Rowing. And so between myself, Chris Chase and Cameron Kasagulis, we rotate, you know, who runs these webinars. This is when we kind of planned a couple months back and we decided to wait until August to gear up for fall. Um, discussing, you know, leveraging parent involvement and the role that the families play in youth sports and vice versa. We're very excited to have Dr. Travis George, PhD with us. He's associate professor and founding director of the Director of Families and Sports Lab in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at Utah State University. And his primary research right now is parent research with the uh, role of youth sports with uh, participation in, on how that affects uh, families. And we're super excited. We obviously have a lot of parents out there and a lot of rowing parents that are maybe very new to the sport, maybe didn't come from it themselves. So we're excited to hear uh, from you, Dr. Dorsch, on how, how our coaches and our club leaders can best you, you know, utilize parents or you know, liaise with them and uh, make their organization stronger. So without further ado, I would love to kick it over to you. Thank you so much for, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm, I'm really excited to be with the group today. I've done similar presentations uh, for USOPC and US Ski and Snowboard. Of course, being here in Utah, um, I'm keen to connect with the folks down in Park City, US Ski and Snowboard, and, uh, and I speak at their Club Excellence Conference uh, pretty much on an annual basis. So this is a talk um, that, that I've tweaked a little bit for your organization, but, but really, you know, parenting is parenting. And, and when we think about parenting in sport, um, what we're going to talk about today are some, some quality cornerstones um, or, or sort of places we can hang our collective hats as parents and places where, where you and the audience as, as club administrators, as coaches, maybe many of you have dual roles, parents and coaches, um, how we can integrate um, parents such that they become uh, you know, something that's a positive for our club ecosystem rather than something that we try and sort of put up a wall against. And I think, you know, parents are a necessary piece of youth sport from the youngest levels. And as we've seen over the past couple of months, really all the way up through um, the Olympic and elite levels. So we'll talk today about um, how we can integrate parents, how we can do so effectively, and more importantly, how we can do so in a way um, that really creates a positive developmentally appropriate youth sport ecosystem for young people. So with that, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And we'll get rolling. Okay, just a, a quick thumbs up maybe on your end. Are we seeing the screen? Okay, perfect. Um, so again, I'd like to frame the talk as thinking about some cornerstones and, and we'll get to the definition of what a cornerstone is, but I think intuitively we all know that these are things where we can sort of anchor our belief systems um, around the, the ecological systems that we're trying to design in U.S. rowing um, around. So I'll give you four key cornerstones, as you would expect, and of, of a square building, four key cornerstones of quality parenting in the U.S. rowing ecosystem. Now, I want to frame our entire talk today um, with, with the understanding that youth sport is not just about the athlete, and in fact, it's not just about the athlete and, and his or her parents. Um, we often try to boil down, I think, youth sport parenting research, which is largely what I engage in, about this sort of dyadic relationship between parent and child. And we, we oftentimes tend to lose focus that, that young athletes are part of a really large sort of ecosystem or youth sport system, as I call it, um, in, the, in the publication you see up here at the right. I'm going to give you a, a, a QR code here to this in a moment so you can find that publication. But what I'd like you to glean from, from this figure is that the athlete is surrounded by a number of significant others. Parents are a huge piece of that, especially at the youngest developmental ages. Siblings can play a huge role. When you think about families um, like, like the Williams sisters, let's say in tennis, or, or for some of my older folks in the audience, the DiMaggio brothers in baseball, right? You think about how siblings can influence both the family and the young athlete's sport experience. And this really comprises the parents, the siblings, and the athlete what I refer to as the family subsystem. At the bottom right of the model, what you see um, that also includes the athlete um, is the peers and the coaches that surround that athlete in what I'll call the team subsystem. Okay, now rowing can be an individual and or team sport. I understand that. But, but regardless, whether, whether folks are participating in an individual sport like, like diving or gymnastics, they are many times part of a team. There are competitors that are taking place uh, that, are, that are engaged as well. So there are always sort of peers 
in the ecosystem when, when young people are participating in sport. And, and as young people develop, and you can see development represented across the long black arrow at the bottom from left to right, as young people develop, the, the parent role shifts and changes, but remains important. But young people also begin in puberty as they mature to begin to look more towards their peers and eventually more towards trusted um, sources of information like coaches and mentors um, as key sources of competence and outcome information. So across development, you can see that all of these people uh, are, are quite important to the outcomes and experiences that young people are going to have in youth sport. Now from the bottom up, what you see in this model is organizations, communities, and, and what you might think of as like societies, in our case, the United States and our sport ecosystem. So all of this that I've just been describing for the last couple of minutes exists within certain organizational cultures. That could be an NGO, an NGB, it could be a local club, you know, recreation rowing team, it could be a collegiate team. These are the organizations that sort of design and deliver sport opportunities for youth. And within or above, I should say, those organizations, subsuming those organizations are the communities and societies that sort of dictate to us why sport matters and, and how sport um, is, is in fact designed, the infrastructure that's put in place. Um, all of that matters to how young people experience sport. So thinking about the young athletes' experiences and outcomes as part of a holistic system, I think is really important and an important launching point uh, for our talk today. Now, as promised, um, you can probably QR this right here on the screen. If not, I'll provide the slide deck at the end of the talk today, and you can do it from, from a static page. Um, but this is a paper that we just had published in 2020. And I had some great colleagues on this work, so, some real experts in coach education, um, some names on there that you'd recognize, Jean Cote, Jay Coakley, who's more at kind of the sport in society um, level, Al Smith, who focuses a lot on, on peer relationships in sport, Jordan Blazo, um, who studies sibling relationships in sport. So really, you know, you think about these colleagues and what they contributed to this paper, I feel like we've really nailed down this idea of what a youth sport system is, and I encourage you to, to jump on it um, if you're into that kind of reading. So when we think about, and I've kind of described these already, but when we think about how um, I believe, at least, we should be defining um, organizations, okay? organizations represented here in yellow. These are really the groups or the entities that are administering sport, right? It could be individual sport, it could be team sport, it could be just recreational opportunities um, for young people. The organizations are tasked with how and when and where do we get young people moving, okay? In your e ecosystem, obviously, there are a number of, of events that would fall under the purview of US rowing. So how do we design those opportunities for, for inner city kids, for rural kids, um, for collegiate experiences, youth experiences, Olympic experiences, all of this falls within and under the NGB, NGO label. We define parents really broadly, and I think that's important in today's day and age with our changing uh, society and changing family structures. So we define parents as, as yes, of course, the biological, um, but also the adoptive or otherwise regular caregivers um, of the young people that are participating. Okay, so this can include um, anybody who we might look at and say, oh yeah, this is somebody's parent, um, but it's not limited necessarily just to mothers and fathers. It could be step parents, aunts, uncles, foster parents, and even in some cases, grandparents who, who care for children. We, we, we tend to think about parents again broadly as, as simply the caretakers, the ones who provide the opportunities for young people to participate in sport. And finally, we define these athletes as the young people themselves who are participating um, across the full range of development, right? And we know that that exists um, at ever younger and younger ages today. Uh, we're talking toddlers out there, um, two and three year olds, all the way up through uh, young and even middle adults who are competing in organized sport opportunities. Parents continue to matter from those youngest ages when they of course play a very pivotal role in children's sport decision-making all the way through the support, the necessary support that's provided as young people mature and grow into young adults if they're fortunate enough to keep playing. Okay, so with that as a background, I wanna jump into our understanding, and I say our sort of scientific or literature-based understanding of, of youth participation. Why do young people participate in sports? And I'll share this with the caveat that, that I think rowing is a, is a very much under-researched youth sports setting. So, so what I'll share here in these next few slides has been gleaned over many decades of research in our field of sport and exercise psychology. Um, but again, acknowledging that a lot of that research has taken place in, in, in popular team sports, such, such as soccer 
and baseball and basketball. Uh, and we're just now, I think, beginning to get to what, what people might consider or might call uh, more fringe sports, um, at least from the mainstream youth sport participation setting, okay? But what we, what we know about young people and why they participate in sports, and I think this research question is broad enough that it would really lend itself to an understanding uh, of the US rowing culture as well. First and foremost, young people like to develop and then demonstrate competence, okay? And this is no different than us as adults. Look, as a professor, I wanna be good at what I do. I want this talk to be well-received. As a husband, you know, I wanna be, uh, be contributing to, to my family, helping my wife, um, helping my kids develop. We all wanna be good at what we do. And, and young athletes are no different. And this, this doesn't depend on the context, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, soccer, rowing, gymnastics, diving. Um, it feels good to execute skills, to execute movements after we've been training to master it, okay? And this is especially true, I think, when that movement uh, is demonstrated in front of people um, for whom we care, right? It could be our parents, it could be our peers, it could be coaches, it could be fans in the stands, community members. Um, and, and, and typically that definition lends itself to competition, right? So we train because we want to show well in competition, right? We wanna develop and demonstrate competence. Secondly, young people want to attain approval and acceptance from adults and peers. And this naturally stems from the goal that I just shared, right? We wanna develop and demonstrate that competence. And then we wanna attain certain levels of approval and acceptance from adults and peers. And I think this is really the first time in the chronological sequencing of being an athlete where parents really come into play and really matter to the young person's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, right? You, you, you've all seen it as coaches or as parents yourself, or maybe even if you think back to your own athletic experiences, right? The, the young athlete does something and then immediately kind of looks up to mom and or dad and or any other significant caregiver um, in the stands, right? Or looks over to the coach at the bench or to, to peers. What they want is that acceptance that, that, yeah, you did that well, you performed that skill well, okay? So not only does it feel good to participate, okay? And to participate with people um, that mean something to us like peers, um, but we want to identify a, 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 as part of a team. We wanna do something with others and, and be part of a collective pulling of the rope in the same direction, if that makes sense as a metaphor, okay? And then the final piece to this puzzle to why young athletes decide to participate altogether is to enjoy their experiences, right? We, sometimes you hear this labeled simply to have fun. I don't necessarily like the word fun because it, it connotates sort of a more um, fleeting or in the moment emotion, whereas enjoyment can surely be derived from something that's not necessarily fun, such as running hard during conditioning or, or rowing hard during a race, right? So we can enjoy something that's inherently difficult where it might not be a lot of fun, but we glean a lot of enjoyment from that experiences. And we want as athletes to enjoy our experiences. It feels good to engage in things that are hard, that are difficult, that challenge us, that allow us to compete against others and sometimes win and sometimes lose, but things that give us a sense of autonomy or volition or choice, okay? So, so nowhere in here, um, although I did mention the word win, I mentioned it in the context of win or lose, but nowhere in here, when we, when we talk to young people about why do you participate, do they say anything about outcomes such as, such as winning? Winning is an inherent, you know, it, it's, it's a piece of competition, it's a piece of participation, but it's not the most important thing to young people. Young people are wired to appreciate the process. And if the process leads to winning or, or being recognized or being named as, a, you know, as an all-state or all-American competitor or as an Olympian, then that's great. But, but I think for the most part, young people really tend to focus on the process of participation and these three um, outcomes that you see before you. So then the flip side of that coin is parent involvement. So if we know how and why young people participate how are parents involved? How do parents help foster that participation? Now, again, decades and decades of research in sport and exercise psychology literature tells us that first and foremost, parents emerge early in the process as providers of sport experiences. They're really the, the initial gatekeepers, right? I have a, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old who are kind of beginning their sport journeys and, um, and, and they're super active. They do a ton of sports. I think my, my young daughter is doing a bunch and I'll talk about her in a little bit. But all of those activities, at least at the beginning, we sort of introduced her to and said, hey, this is an option. Do you want to do it? 
you know, she didn't come home from school and, and just one day decide, hey, I want to go play soccer. We learned of the soccer league. We introduced it to her. We asked her if she wanted to play. And, and, and now she's been playing for multiple seasons. So parents as gatekeepers, parents as providers of the experience, right? Um, this, this can include registering for lessons, seasons, teams. Of course, we're the chauffeurs, right? We're, we're driving them um, to training, to competitions. We're purchasing the equipment, right? So we're their sponsors as well. Um, oftentimes we act as their de facto sports psychologists when things are going poorly. We attend the events, we're their supporters, um, we're their nutritionists, their launderers. We're, we're doing all of this. Uh, I'm sure on the back side of the screen right now, many of the parents are, are smiling and laughing um, and wondering how long <laughs> the pain is going to last. But this is what we do because we value sport, right? We think it's an appropriate context for youth development. So we put resources into it. We're the providers of that experience. Parents are also role models in sport and physical activity settings, right? So, so very rarely, it happens occasionally, and I've actually researched some families like this, but very rarely do, do young people end up playing sports that their parents at one point maybe didn't even sample, right? We become role models. So if we were a runner, we're gonna introduce our child to running. If we were a rower, we'll introduce them to rowing. And oftentimes this will then lead in a tangential way to a new and a different sport opportunity. Um, but, it's, but it's very rare that, that parents who aren't what we might call quote unquote sporty have children that, that get these opportunities early on. So I think it's really important to understand that parents need to model, not necessarily sport, right? If you have a, a son or a daughter, competing as a rower. You, you don't necessarily need to hop in the skull and, and, and be modeling that behavior, but, but be going for walks, be going for jogs, be shooting hoops in the driveway, right? be active, be role modeling what it means to care about sport and physical activity in your life. And it shows young people then um, that, that learning, that having social interactions through sport, that performance outcomes, that all of these things actually do matter. Right? Because we know the literature tells us that young people do look to us, especially at the earliest ages. I'm talking pre-puberty here, especially at those early ages. Young people look to us and say, well, mom and dad are simply sitting around watching movies. Why do they want me to go play soccer? Why do they want me to be on the rowing team? So when we can be active, when we can model that behavior ourselves, it then becomes an easy family activity and family learning process or socialization process through which our young people are engaged and motivated to remain engaged. And then finally, parents um, stay involved, I'll say, as interpreters of the experience. And, 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 and when I say stay involved, I don't mean that this only happens in the later stages, but it becomes more salient to the athlete in the later stages, right? So by interpreting experiences, what I mean is, uh, you know, what do you value? What are you cheering for? What are you talking about on the car ride home from a competition? You know, are you the soccer parent or the basketball parent, or in fact, the rowing parent? who's simply yelling and yelling and yelling and wanting outcome after outcome after outcome, right? Is it all about winning? Is it all about scoring? Is it all around beating um, someone on a different team, right? Or in a different boat in your case? We interpret experiences. I, I have a great example of my daughter's soccer game um, of a mom and, and she, was, she was wonderful. And what I heard her yelling for from the sidelines in my daughter's game last week was, was amazing. She was talking about, hey, great pass. And then I saw her daughter score later and the mom was quiet. And I asked the mom, I said, how come you, how come you were cheering and yelling for the pass, but not for the goal? And she says, look, you know, everybody's going to get feedback when they score a goal. The coach is giving them a high five. The teammates are jumping up and down. But what I need to do as a parent is reward those other experiences and let my daughter know that passing is valuable, that I value that as a parent. I thought that was really cool. So, so finding an analogy, finding an analogous, uh, excuse me, an, an analogy in the growing experience, I think would be really beneficial for parents as well. Figure out what it's important for your athlete to value, and then you value that as a parent to reinforce that, all right? So we're the providers, we're the role models, and we're the interpreters of our young athletes' experiences. Okay, so what I've just laid out over the past couple of slides has to do with parents' roles and ultimately athletes' goals. And oftentimes I think we, we, we think about this in the reverse directionality. We think that, look, our athletes' goals should lead to how parents are involved, right? We ask our athlete, hey, what's your goal? And then we build our, our role or an, our involvement around that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And, and the spoiler alert here is that, that these are actually recursive. They, they feed back into one another. But what I'd like to do today is lay out an argument for parents' roles actually leading in a positive way to athletes' goals, right? So in other words, if we parent right, 
and I'm going to tell you later, there's no right way to parent, but if we parent right, right, that our athletes' goals will naturally fall into place for themselves. They'll be intrinsically motivated, okay? So let's, let's lay this out for a second. When we talk about our athletes' goals, um, again, they're the three that I just laid out on, on two slides ago, right? Developing and demonstrating physical competence, attaining approval and acceptance from adults and peers, and ultimately enjoying their experiences. Parent roles are being the provider of, exp of, of sport experiences, being role models in sport and physical activity settings, and then being interpreters of those sport experiences and outcomes. So our goal today, right? I, what, what I'd like to focus on today is the actual mechanisms that lead us, right? To understanding how roles and goals go together, okay? So now that we've outlined these two, let's focus kind of on this middle point, And that is the link between parenting and actual experiences and outcomes. Okay, so this, this question really is the heart of why we set out almost two years ago now to build a, what, what we've called the quality parenting framework. And initially this started as a project um, that was supported by United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee uh, because of the nature of, of COVID and the changing of, of the recent uh, Tokyo Games, and now that butting up against in six months, the Winter Games in Beijing. As you can imagine, everybody at USOPC is running around um, like, like their hair's on fire. And I, and I completely understand that. So what was once a project for them has now sort of landed more at the NGB level. And we are, we are focusing more um, with some of our key strategic partners at the NGB and NGO level to really implement some of these changes with this quality parenting framework. And we see this framework really as a sister document or a, or a sister philosophy um, to the quality coaching framework that came out, I think in 2006 or seven, Wade Gilbert and his group put that out. That's, that's pretty widely used across, I think there are 56 maybe NGBs, NGOs that fall under the USOPC umbrella. So what I'd like to do for the next maybe half of the presentation is, is focus on the quality parenting framework and, and leave you guys with some key resources, tips, tools, and strategies for how best to implement parent involvement in the U.S. rowing ecosystem. So I'm really proud of, of what I'll call here the core authorship team uh, that I was able to put together. Some of these names you might recognize, but, but you've got a nice variety here um, of PhDs, of MDs, of orthopedists, um, uh, uh, you know, folks like Niru who focus on, you know, child overuse injuries. So this is not just you know, a social science team. This is really a, an integrated um, interdisciplinary squad, if you will, that put together this document. Um, I'm very, very proud that uh, Mo Weiss, who is my academic grandmother, um, was on the team and Dan Gould, her former advisor, who's my academic great grandfather, um, were on the team. Th these two names you, you might recognize if you've read widely uh, in the youth sport uh, psychology literature, and then really some some nice new up and comers and some mid career folks as well, but really a strong team um, that helped me put together this document. Now, we, we, we put together a first draft uh, and following that first draft or that first iteration, we passed along the document to a team of international consultants because although we, we wanted this to be focused on um, our core constituency, and that is the NGBs and NGOs that fall under the USOPC umbrella, we also wanted this to be applicable and in fact, informed by research that's, that's been conducted um, around the world. So we had folks from Canada, we had folks from Lithuania, from the UK, from Brazil and from Australia um, that were on this team of international consultants that, that helped us move from iteration one to iteration two. Uh, and we very much appreciate their work. I'll leave them unnamed because I promised I would um, but, but they were key in helping us move this along uh, toward, toward its present publication. And following that review by the team of international consultants, we then had four um, US-based expert reviewers, all of whom had worked with um, USOPC in some form, uh, whether applied or in a research capacity that reviewed the final iteration of the document. And that's where we are today. So what is the quality parenting framework? Um, it, it turns out that it's, you know, it's, it's a number of pages of evidence-based um, strategies that, that, that really lend themselves to understanding youth sport through the lens of what I presented at the top. And you can see in the upper left here, kind of a miniature model that I presented at the top, uh, the youth sport system. And if you're familiar with the American developmental model, you see that here sort of um, center upper right. 
Um, these are kind of two places where we hung our hats. We wanted this again to align neatly um, and purposefully with the quality coaching framework um, such that we recognize parents and coaches as two key contributors to the youth sport experience and youth sport development in and of itself. So what I've tried to do in, in the rest of today's presentation is distill these 30 some pages down into kind of four key cornerstones or four key takeaways that we can focus on when we think about the question of what is, what does it mean to be a quality parent in the US rowing ecosystem? So here are um, four cornerstones of quality parenting. Okay, so I think it's important before we dive into those cornerstones to, to first at least provide a, a general rubric for what, what I view a, corner, a cornerstone as, right? Cornerstones, as you might know, this, this goes all the way back to, you know, to ancient Greece, to ancient Rome, to the building of our great cities, um, New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, right? All big buildings on big city blocks. I'm looking out at our university right here. Some of our um, longest standing university buildings have these cornerstones that become the anchors of what the building is. They're laid uh, you know, in sequence, they mark the location, they mark the orientation of a building. And I think it's really important if we think about those words, the locationality and the orientation of something being marked by cornerstones. So what I'm trying to do today for you as an organization is think about locating parents within the organization. What is their role within the US rowing ecosystem? And what's the orientation? Right? What things are public facing? What things are private or family facing? What things are coach parent interaction facing? Right? So, so the orientation of some of this I think is really important as well when we think about parents' roles. Okay? So continuing to use the meta metaphor of cornerstones, let's dive into four cornerstones that I think are, are quite important to youth sport parenting. And that is the affordance of experiences, right? the alignment, how parents are aligned or not with an organization, acceptance, how do parents accept the experiences that their children are having? And then awareness. Can parents be more aware um, of their role and their impact on an organization? So let's dive into each, each of these four um, in, in greater detail. So the first cornerstone, if you recall, was affordance. And, and this aligns nicely, I think, with, with parents' roles that I talked about earlier, right? Parents provide athletes opportunities to explore, innovate, and make decisions. It's super important that although parents are, are the gatekeepers, as I said earlier, that once we introduce and give the gift of sport to our young people, that we can also get the heck out of the way. That we can provide for them opportunities to, to be explorative, to innovate on their own, to make their own decisions. In other words, not to micromanage their process of being an athlete, being and becoming an athlete, I should say. So, I think it's important that we, we as parents engage in, and I think it's important that NGB leaders, coaches, coach trainers and educators, that they engage in autonomy supportive communication, right? Asking questions like, right, to a young athlete, are you excited to row again this season? Not, hey, I signed you up for rowing your first practice is Monday. How much training do you wanna do, right? Rather than assuming, hey, you're 12, now I'm gonna bump you up to the next level, it's five days a week, you know, sorry about you if you don't wanna do it. Okay, which races would you like to compete in? These are but three of the infinite number of questions that we could ask that are child focused, that provide autonomy supportive communication with that child. Again, giving them um, sort of the reins or the ownership of the experience. And I think as parents, it's really important that we begin to do that, right? It needs to be scaffolded. We, we probably can't ask these questions to a five-year-old, but as a child begins to show interest um, and potential in a sport, it's important that we sort of give them the keys to that kingdom and continue to foster their intrinsic motivation while at the same time, allowing them to make decisions for themselves. Because when you ask these types of questions, and I've used this term a couple of times now, you're able better to develop intrinsic motivation, right? Which is the, the love of sport that comes from within rather than because you know mom and dad said you had to or because your coach said you were good or because you'd feel guilty if you didn't do it. Um, or because you know the community is pressuring you. I always give the example of like being a, a, an American football player in Texas, right? Or a soccer player in Germany or Brazil. There's that extrinsic motivation to do it. But what we want to develop is an intrinsic motivation to do it. And I think rowing is really well positioned to do that. Um, you know, being that it, it is in some respects a bit of a niche sport. So, so when kids find it and fall in love with it, that intrinsic motivation is ready to be built in automatically. 
right? And we know from, from many decades of literature, hundreds, maybe thousands of studies that when we increase intrinsic motivation, we also increase young people's enjoyment of a sport and their commitment to continue participating. And ultimately, I think as an NGB, when you think about the, the health of your organization, a lot of that stems from, hey, can we get kids to come back from year one to year two, from year two to year five, to year five, to year 10? Can we keep them in the pipeline? Right. So at the very forefront of that is the development of intrinsic motivation. And at the fore of that is how parents and coaches are actually communicating to kids on the ground on a daily basis. So affordance is really important. We not only have to provide the opportunity for the sport participation, but we have to do it um, in, quote unquote, the right way. The second cornerstone I want to talk about is alignment. OK, so, so we need parents to align their expectations to the athlete's desires. But more than that, we want to make sure that parents and athletes are on the same page as the club and the coach, and in this case, maybe the NGB as well. So seeing this alignment across the triangle that I'm depicting at the bottom right here is really important. Okay? It's really important. And, and oftentimes, I find that there are introspective ways that parents can approach their involvement um, you know, when thinking about, okay, so now I've had a conversation with my kid in the car, kids off doing their homework or they've gone to bed. And I, as a parent now need to reflect and say, what goals do I actually have for my athlete in their sport? You know, do those goals align with, with, with my child's goals? Do they align with what the organization is trying to do with what the coach is trying to accomplish? Okay. How am I supporting one set of goals, maybe in lieu of the other, right? So, so here are my goals, here are the club's goals, here are the athlete's goals, right? Hopefully they all align, but if they don't, which goals am I actually supporting, right? So if there's misalignment between mine and my child's, hopefully I'm helping support my child's, right? Or at least, at the very least, the organization's, okay? And then finally, do our goals align with those in the club and coach? So again, it's this constant iteration of my athlete's desires, the club and the coach's needs to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish at an organizational level, and then my own expectations or hopes and desires that we all have as parents. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. We all have goals for our kids and for their participation, but how can we get those to better align throughout the course of participation? Okay. The third cornerstone that I'll share today is the idea of acceptance. And I think we all as humans strive to be more accepting, but oftentimes things that I've just presented on like our goals, like our communication strategies, like the affordances that we give our kids stand in the way of us accepting. Right? My wife always uses the phrase um, future memories. You know, we have, we have future memories of our kids, right? Maybe that's of our 12 year old as an Olympian or our 15 year old as having a career in some field, being a doctor or a lawyer or a fireman or whatever it is that they want to become, right? But, but accepting the here and the now and the today allows us to better encourage our athletes to share openly, right? Think about this as just a brief thought experiment. If, if our athlete knows that our goal for them is to go, go row in college, okay? And, and they don't want to, right? They're less likely then to, to come to us and share openly about their experiences, about their outcomes, about, you know, I'm just out there because I, I like being with my friends and I like the physical activity and I like working hard and getting strong and fit, okay? I like being part of a team. Um, so, so again, this all fits with what we've talked about earlier with the goal alignment, with accepting what our young people want to do. Um, but this takes it one step further then and, and affords an opportunity for our young people to actually share openly and honestly about their experiences, their fears, their outcomes, their joys and pleasures in sport, okay? In other words, we want to be their confidant in sport. We want to be there to fully support their experiences and outcomes. And I think what this ultimately boils down to is building safe contexts of communication, okay? For your family, for your team or club, it might be at the venue pre or post training. Uh, for a family, it could be in the car, in the minivan, or the suburban, on the drive home, it could be around the kitchen table. It really can be anywhere and everywhere. As we know, sport imbues itself into all um, settings for family life and for team life. So coaches and parents and peers, even as you build in opportunities to be open and honest with one another, it's important that we do this everywhere and anywhere. Now, what are some of the sort of on the ground behaviors that lend themselves to sharing openly and honestly? I think first and foremost, for parents listening actively. And, and I've 
I've fallen into this trap. I know this literature, you know, but my, my daughter came home from, from practice the other day. I had had a long day at work. I was trying to get a lot of things done and she was telling me about her soccer practice and I'm, you know, answering an email to one of my, one of my students about something, not listening actively to my daughter about soccer. So in the long run, if, if, if that's who I am, if that's what I'm doing all the time, she's simply going to stop talking to me about soccer. Hopefully this was a one-off. I'm going to try and make it a one-off. Okay. But being an active listener is really important. Showing your young people that, that you care. And this, you know, undoubtedly applies to coaches as well. When an athlete comes to you, don't be too busy you know, fiddling with your, with your training plan or talking to another athlete or watching the regatta that's on TV. Listen actively, turn your attention to that athlete and, and be with them. Demonstrating understanding and empathy. You might not agree with what they're telling you, but, but understanding and empathy shows that you care and that you're trying to understand their perspective on what it is they're trying to tell you. Um, this applies also to tone of voice con that conveys care, right? You're in this together. That's kind of the take home from this slide is that, look, your experience is my experience and, and I'm here for you, okay? And I think that's really important uh, for parents and coaches as young athletes develop, as they, as they figure out what they're good at and what they love and they try and rise to higher and higher levels, it needs to be about the athlete, not anymore about the parent or the coach or even the organization. It needs to be very athlete focused and holistic in nature, okay? We're in this together. And the final cornerstone that I want to share today is that we should all try to engage purposefully and with care as parents. And what I mean by that is that, that look, we're, we're all going to have different roles. Some of us are going to be very active. Some of us are going to be yellers um, from, the, from the shore or the, or the stands or the finish line. Some of us are even going to be assistant coaches. Okay, We're all going to have different roles, but we must all engage purposefully and with care. And, and what I mean when I say that is that, that, look, you need to be sort of aware of who you are and how you fit in the general ecosystem of the team. And as a parent, that oftentimes means, look, talking to the club director or to the coach and especially to your athlete and asking them, hey, how do I fit in? How can I help? Right? Because the last thing parents want to do is hinder the experience. I, I promise you that to a man, to a woman. Right? Parents don't want to hinder their athlete's experience. They all want what's best for their athlete. Right? I mean, maybe, maybe a few cases across the globe, but, but for the most part, parents really want their children to thrive and to do well. And I think where where sometimes we see a rub is that they don't know the best strategies to do so. So they become over-assertive, they become over-involved, or at least what we might call over-involved. And, and that's then where, you know, coaches put up walls, organizations, you know, put, put together sets of rules and contracts for parents to keep them away because we're not doing it in a way that's, that's appropriate, okay? So again, back to this idea of introspection, parents asking themselves, you know, is the quality and the quantity of my involvement allowing my athlete to thrive? What can I do more of? What can I do less of? Where can I turn over the keys to, to my athlete and to their coach and to that relationship? Okay. And I think ultimately what it boils down to is prioritizing the physical, psychological, and socio-emotional growth of the athlete. Again, this is looking at them through a holistic lens, but I think we need to think about, okay, if we want X, Y, and Z to be outcomes of their participation in sport, how do we arrive at that from the time they're two and three years old and start doing these, these young learn to play sport opportunities at the recreational level to the time that they might achieve a world-class level or not somewhere, anywhere in between. But, but if we think about that full range of sporting endeavors, how do we get them from A to B most effectively and, and most importantly, um, strong physically, which I think we all think about and maybe something we think less about is strong psychologically and strong emotionally when they arrive at those upper levels as well. And for what it's worth, this doesn't only apply to our children as parents, but I think it's also our responsibility to make sure that their teammates, coaches, and yeah, even their competitors also experience this growth, right? This is, this is, what, this is why we all engage in sport and it's what sport is in fact all about. So we have a great responsibility as parents to, to really focus on our engagement and how that facilitates or not the growth of young people in these contexts. Okay. I want to, I wanna, as we start to draw this down, I want to think about or remind the audience that these cornerstones, these four cornerstones that I've shared, I'd like to think of as principles rather than practices. And this is language drawn directly from the quality coaching framework and Wade Gilbert and, and his authorship team. But when we think about principles, they're, they're a little bit different than practices, right? Practices are universal strategies that will work for every parent in every context, right? I can tell you something about rowing or basketball or soccer um, or youth sport or adult sport or anything in between. And this is what parents should do to be better at parenting. That's not what today's about. 
today, I think, is, is more about giving you guys principles, tools, strategies, okay, that you can adapt and place and pull and plug in your, your natural context that you find yourself in, right? I mean, look, even within the sport of rowing or, or the, the, the multiple sports that comprise this, this umbrella of rowing, you can think about the number of different contexts that parents might find themselves in um, from the earliest stages to the latest stages, from the individual to the more team focused events. So it, it's context dependent. And that's why I started the day today with, with that big model of the youth sports system, because all of that matters. Your family matters, the team matters, the organization matters, the community matters, and our society matters. Okay, so think about some of the strategies that I've given today and apply them as principles to build your own. If you're a club coordinator or you're a coach educator, think about some of these and how you might sort of thread the needle with them within your context or, or social, social milieu, if you will, um, to really get the best out of the parents at your club. Okay, so again, the, the acknowledgement here is that there's no single correct way to parent that fosters successful experiences and outcomes. But the take home is that there's, there's one sort of philosophy and that is a holistic understanding of youth development that we can all subscribe to, right? So, so focused on the young athlete and their physical, their cognitive or mental, and then their socio-emotional development. And not only for, for our child in sport, but for everyone who's involved in that setting. And if we do that, I don't think we go wrong. Okay, so a couple of reminders, right? Growth is not always linear. We think about the youngest stages um, and then we think about, you know, we dream, we have these future memories, as I said earlier, of our, of our child as becoming an Olympian, right? All of us have had those daydreams, uh, but, but the pathway is not linear, right? The pathway is not easily set out upon. There's a lot of randomness and there's a lot of opportunity and luck and successes and failures that, that, that happen between A and Z. So letting that process unfold and letting our young people own that process, I think is really, really important, okay? And this aligns nicely with what we see in the American developmental model, really all the way through stages one, all the way through stage four, is that there are gonna be natural spurts and fits when we think about success and failure in sport and growth and development, okay? So again, think back to those three parent roles, right? Think back to those three parent roles and how we can be involved, how we can scaffold our young people's development, and then ultimately how we kind of get out of the way and allow the coach-athlete relationship to develop in a way that we can stand back and be proud supporters of our young people. I loved some of the commercials and some of the, you know, just handheld videos that I saw from the Olympics, watching some of these parents and caregivers and grandparents and folks that, of course, for Tokyo weren't allowed to be on the ground, but were back at home hosting their parties and just the pride in the faces, not only of those parents, but gosh, of those athletes when they finish their event and, and, and being able to see on FaceTime or whatever it was in real time, see their, their families and their loved ones back there supporting them, knowing and seeing these tears, I'm kind of crying right now, but seeing the tears emerge as these young people reflected probably, you know, upon 15, 20, 25, 30 years of, of having parents back there supporting them on this squiggly journey of success. A second reminder that I think is really important is that sampling and specialization are not mutually exclusive. This is really important. I think a lot of times, maybe not so much in rowing, but a lot of times we think about, look, a kid's either on a pathway of, of sampling, in which case they're going to do it all, we're going to introduce them to everything, or they're on a pathway of specialization. And that's how you become elite. We're going to get them in the sport as early as we can. We're going to give them as much experience as they can. And we're going to let the chips fall where they may and see if they can make it to the highest levels. I'm here to tell you that the research actually says these are not mutually exclusive. And I want to give you um, an, an, an uh, uh, autoethnography here of my daughter, kind of a case study, if you will, of a, of a seven-year-old ski racer. Um, and she, the number in the bottom, 110, represents her days on snow this year. We had 110 um, days on so, snow, some of which were in the gates training, as you see here, some of which were free skiing, which kind of relates to what you might call free play, right? And some of it was kind of coached drills um, and or coached free skiing. So kind of all across the participation levels, 110 days. Now you might look at that and say, wow, you know, for a seven-year-old, that's a ton. She's a specializer. You know, she's going to get burnt out. There's no way she achieves at an elite level. But when we look at the remainder of her sport participation across the year, 
um, she, she's doing a lot. She's actually also sampling a number of different sports. 52 days on the ice with her hockey team, 24 days on the grass with her soccer team, you know, 16, 16 practices and games playing flag football, track and field, um, basketball, mountain climbing, or rock climbing, you know, dance. She's, she's doing all of these things. So within the context of specialization, right, skiing is, is obviously her first priority here. Um, in a sporting sense, she's also sampling a number of other sports. And I think it's important that we think about that, especially at the young, young levels, when we don't know what a young person is going to fall in love with, what their body is going to grow into, what they're ultimately you know, going to be good at, what their talent will afford them an opportunity to do, that we allow them an opportunity to explore, to have downtime from a primary sport, and to sample a number of other sports. Okay. This really applies um, or, or fits nicely with the American developmental model um, stages one through three. A third reminder for parents, and I, I like this one a lot. I'm, I'm gonna pat myself on the back for developing this one, but parents are not always assistant coaches, but should always be assistants to the coach. Okay, so what do I mean by that? It, it's not, as I say in the first sentence, the parents always need to be a paid or, or volunteer assistant coach. They always need to be on the sidelines or on the shore or on the boat. Um, in the case of U.S. rowing. But what they need to do is understand the coach's priorities, the coach's system, the coach's philosophy, and they need to assist in implementing that for their athlete. Because look, even at, the, even at the primary levels of sport, when, when young people are participating three, four, five, six, eight hours a day at the highest levels, they're still, in many cases, going home to their parents, right? So let's think about an average 10 or 12-year-old that might have school during the day, then they're going to go do two hours of programming after school in a, in a primary sport, two or three hours. Okay. They're still spending more time at home with mom and dad in the mornings and the afternoons, more time with their peers in school, more time with their teachers in school than they are with that coach. So the coach needs some assistance. Okay. We need to look to the coach to be a leader in this domain, right? Coaches. And this is why I think almost every NGO has coach education leadership, right? Because we're trying to train our coaches, but at the same time, they can't do it alone. We need parents to be assistants to the coach, not assistant coaches. Okay, and I've given you a number of ways um, that that can happen here in these bullet points. And then finally, my last reminder for parents is that sport is more fun when it's family. Okay, I'm, I, I am a volunteer parent assistant coach for our local ski team here. And this is one of the things I'm always thinking about is how do we integrate families, siblings and parents into the sport experience to make it more fun? Because when we do that effectively, we have positive interactions. And again, we know from the literature, positive interactions lends itself to quality relationships being developed among those siblings, athletes, parents, and coaches. And when quality relationships develop, we start to build a sense of community. And when we build a sense of community, everyone's experiences and outcomes are enhanced and the cycle continues to build, okay? So we can't simply start at the bottom of this and say, we're just gonna enhance experiences and outcomes. We're gonna hire the best coach and that's all we're gonna do. We're gonna win, 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 okay? We can't simply say, we're gonna build a sense of community, right? Everybody sign up, meet your neighbor. Okay, we have to start up at the top. We have to start with positive interactions. Parents have to be positive on the shore, in the stands, in their email chains. Positive interactions are where this all starts, builds quality relationships, builds sense of community, and ultimately for the athletes, builds enhanced experiences and outcomes. And I shouldn't just say for the athletes, that's also for the parents and the coaches as well, which is great, okay? This also aligns with the American developmental model uh, stages one through three for what it's worth. Okay, so let's wrap it up here and then we'll get to um, some Q&A. Um, the four cornerstones, again, that we talked about are affordance, alignment, acceptance, and awareness. These stem largely from uh, the quality parenting framework that I introduced at the top of the segment today. Um, our lab has a number of additional parenting resources, sort of more general and, and, and more broad parenting resources that you can find here if you scan um, the QR code at the bottom right of your screen. But I encourage you to think about what affordance, alignment, acceptance, and awareness mean to you um, as a family, as a parent, if there are any athletes watching, what it means to you, and maybe most importantly, um, what it means to, to the clubs themselves. Because as, as you saw in the model that I shared at the top, it is the clubs that design and deliver the sport experience to youth. So how are you interacting with parents as well? This is not a one-way street. And I think there's some responsibility on the side of, of clubs and organizations um, to interact in a way with parents that, that gives them an opportunity um, to align with you and your broader mission.
All right, I'll leave it there. Um, say thank you very much and happy to answer any questions now. I know um, time is maybe short at some point, we might have to cut it off, but I'm happy to engage on email or on Twitter if folks wanna find me there and, and don't have a chance to, to interact here in real time, please reach out and, and happy to interact with you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Travis. Um, yeah, please use the Q&A. Um, I've got a couple to kind of get us started if that's okay with you, Travis. To Absolutely. get going and warm me up a little bit and then i'm sure some will start coming in the q a you know just because you know i know a lot of people i see a lot of participants some of our level three coaches i see a lot of program leaders and you know you've talked a lot about how important like the appropriate roles are for parents what can these club leaders what can the leaders of our programs our head coaches the ones that kind of set the tones for the program like they have the power to do that do you have any quick, you know, quick tips or like, how do they set the stage to have these appropriate parent relationships and to help our parents, you know, know what is appropriate, what's not, and what they can do? Because I think we can all agree that no parent is ill intended in this area. But you know, they, like you've you said multiple times, what are, what's the appropriate role and what can we do to help set the stage for that? Sure, I think that's a really important question and a really good one. Um, so thanks for thanks for sending it along. First and foremost, I think it's it's incumbent upon coaches to leverage the strengths that parents bring to the table, right? No matter a parent who's an accountant, bring them on and help help the club with with accounting. Uh, in, in my case, I'm a level 100 um, coach, trained coach for US ski and snowboard. Um, I'm never, I was never a ski racer. I'm never going to know the technical and the tactical. But my role as a volunteer assistant coach is to help with some of the mind games of skiing with the young people. Um, you know, I'm a socio-emotional coach. I'm, I'm a guy who can do some sports psychology things. Um, I'm there to help the younger kids and to make sure they're, they're enjoying and developing that intrinsic motivation. So, so that's an example of how you can bring a parent on to not be in the way, but to leverage the strengths that are pre-existing. Um, you know, maybe you have, you know, a mom who, who, who's got a sprinter van. So maybe they're the transportation, you know, the go-to for transportation and, and they're bringing six or eight kids to practice every day. I mean, there's, look, parent, parents are willing to help. They want to help. They want to be engaged. So I think as a coach in a strategic way, finding how and where different parents can help your program and, and allowing them to do so, not putting up those walls is, is really strategic for you because it allows you as a coach then um, to maybe think more about the technical and the tactical and less about all the logistics of what it takes to run a club. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to have that parent with some experience. So bringing them on and allowing them to share that, um, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Kind of an open door policy is kind of what you're... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think in the minority of cases, you, you might have a problem where a parent oversteps and, and, and then there needs to be a conversation to be had, of course. But, but again, if, if you're good at setting boundaries, if you're good at communicating, um, and if it's okay with the young athlete whose parent you know, we're, we're talking about, I think it's really important and really effective to bring on parents as, as you know, again, not assistant coaches per se, always, but as assistants to the coach, to allow that coach to focus on you know, why they've been hired, why they're being paid. And typically that's the technical and the tactical aspects of whatever sport is being engaged in. Mm -hmm. And what have you seen um, in your research when you think of teams that do this well and organizations that do this well, how do they communicate that? Is that, you know, an opening letter at the beginning of the season? Is it kind of like, you know, there's back to school night that we're all getting ready to go back to those types of things right now, yeah. and, you know, parent info session. W what have you seen as some of the most effective ways to communicate that and to try to start figuring out who those parents are and how do we do yeah, that? It's a great question. I, I actually, I don't think we do it well in this country. Um, I, like, mm -hmm. I liked the words you chose earlier and that is kind of an open door policy um, to sort of set the table for, look, there, there's not a wall between the coaches and the parents. There, there are appropriate times to talk about um, things that relate to training and, and competition. Um, and there are inappropriate times to do so. But look, when it comes to general communication, you have to have an open door policy and, and just throwing it out there and saying, hey, look, if you think you can help the team in a certain way, come to me and we'll, we'll chat about it. it. The answer might be yes, the answer might be no, the answer might be later, but, but let's talk about it because look, we're all, again, to borrow the metaphor I used earlier, trying to pull this rope in the same direction so let's figure out who can help and where. Now, to, to be more specific in answering your question, I think one really nice example that, that, that some folks are starting to hear about and think about, especially in the Alpine and Nordic skiing community are, are Norway. Norway has a really strong youth sport system that really does integrate parents into the youngest levels 
um, of development in, in many of the sports, not just Nordic and Alpine skiing. And I think we can look to them as an example potentially. Um, so, so yeah, I'll leave it there maybe. And, and, and look, whoever asked that question, I really appreciate it. I feel like I could talk mm -hmm. about it for an hour. So if you want to connect um, offline, we can do that. You touched on this a little bit. We did get a specific question um, on, you know, what happens when you get the other side of the coin. You get the, whether it's the inappropriate or the over-involved parent, you know, what, um, you know, you said having the conversation, you know, how do you know when it's time to have that conversation? And how do you go about having that conversation? Well, if it's, if it's becoming uncomfortable for the coach and maybe more importantly for the athlete, it's time to have the conversation. Um, you know, parents being involved, parents inserting themselves should provide more comfort to the coach and, and more comfort to the athlete because it's making the mission of the team better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when that's not happening, um, if, if the young athlete comes to the coach and says, gosh, I wish mom and dad wouldn't be so involved. Or if the coach is saying, gosh, these, you know, these, these folks are, they mean well, but they're not really helping. They're really hurting. Then the conversation needs to be had. And I think that conversation can be open, honest, transparent, respectful, um, it doesn't simply need to be, you know, a mandate that, you know, you're not allowed to talk to me or you're not allowed to come to training, right? Having that, you know, look, most, most parents are sensible people and they, again, and they want what's best for their young people. So, um, so I think having that conversation once, twice if necessary, and then if there needs to be some, some, you know, remediation after that, then, then you figure out what's the best strategy. Maybe it does mean, you know, telling the parent, Hey, look, I you know, really appreciate it. if you don't come to training, um, you're welcome to come to competitions, but, but during the window of competition, if you could allow the athlete to, communicate with the coaches and the team rather than you, that'd be great. So sometimes some boundaries are needed. I've actually found anecdotally, I don't have research evidence to support this, but I've actually found that sometimes having the athlete, if they're mature enough, have that conversation with the parent rather than the coach is more effective. So if you got, you know, an athlete who let's, let's say is 12, 13, 15, 16 years old and would feel comfortable going and talking to mom or dad about this and just saying, Hey, look, you know, I know you love me. I love you. You're making life kind of hard on me in sports right now. If you could just chill a little bit, my coach and I got this, um, you know, here's some ways maybe that you can remain involved and help. But as far as training goes, or as far as, you know, the car ride home, I don't need you know, technical advice anymore. You know, we got it covered. This is why you're writing the check to the coach. Those conversations can be effective. I think parents um, that resonates with parents, maybe more than a coach who just, you know, throws up a wall or at least is perceived to be throwing up a wall. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you be for or against a, you know, we've seen, we've seen this in our level three group, people that do this, um, a do's and don'ts parenting list before season starts or like actually yeah, I mean, outlining like this is appropriate parent behavior. This is not appropriate parent behavior. Yeah. Super, super good question. I mean, I think it goes back to that idea of principles versus practices. Um, the do's and don'ts tends to fall more on the side of practices. Um, I'm more inclined to say I would like that list if it's a bit vague and, and broad and open-ended. Um, so let me give you an example. If it says, don't talk to your child about their competition, you know, in the car ride home, I think that's too specific. I think that applies to many families, but maybe not to all. If you say, don't, you know, don't yell at your child from the sidelines during a competition or from the shore during a competition, again, I think that might apply, apply to some families, but not all. Maybe some athletes actually do better when mom and dad are there screaming. So, so I think these, these recommendations would need to be broad enough. You know, such, let me give you an example of that. A broad one might be, you know, don't, don't communicate with your child in a way that makes them feel bad about him or herself. Okay, that's, that's broad enough that it doesn't say what to do or what not to do, but it tells you how not to leave your child feeling during or after a competition. So, so I think... I've kind of given you a non-answer here, but I, but I think I don't like do's and don'ts, but I'm okay with it. I guess if it, if it is both evidence-based and vague enough that it can sort of fit any family in any context. Mm -hmm. Well, I would think that ideally it's driving with, you know, maybe what are the principles that the coach uses to coach the team right. that like, you know, this is what's important to this organization, or this team, and this is what that looks like from a parent perspective. hundred percent. Okay. Great. Well, we got actually, we also, we have a couple more questions. I think we can squeeze them in. And they're from, it looks like we got some parents asking questions. Um, so the first one um, is about, you know, when you were talking about um, kind of, especially when athletes are getting first involved in the sport and how do you balance, you know, the autonomy and wanting them to, you know, drive it in terms of the commitment level and what are they going to try and what are they going to do with a sport like rowing that does take a, it is a, the practices are long. Like it's hard to do like just a 30 minute, 
rowing practice or, oh, it's only one part of this camp that's got lots of different sports. Like it's a pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's something that requires a decent amount of commitment from the beginning, even if you're just doing a learn to row program. So how do you balance that where, you know, the sport takes a little more involvement to get going? So how do you balance parents like wanting the kid to give it a chance? Yep. While also respecting that, you know, it's the, it's gotta be, um, you know, they have to drive it. It's a great question. It, it, it actually reminds me a lot of my own experiences as a, as a race, you know, ski racing parent, if you will. Um, you know, skiing is not just a sport you jump into for, for 50 bucks and, and go let them try it out. Um, ski racing, I should say. Um, there's an initial investment. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that my research lends itself to understanding is that when we as parents make an investment, we want to see some return on that investment. Now, the, where the rubber meets the road is how we define that return on investment, right? Is that, you know, ma making a squad or competing at a, a regional or a statewide or a national or international level? Like what, what is the ROI that we value as a parent? And one thing I think the parents who do this the best, I think what they show their children is that they value process over outcomes, right? So things like, I want you to work hard. I want you to enjoy the sport. I want you to learn lessons like you know, listening to a coach and respecting authority figures and, and respecting teammates and competitors, you know, when it's about that process and, and, and when we frame it that way, then the athlete can, can take on those behaviors autonomously. But when it's about, you know, when the conversation sounds like, Hey, you know, we put in a thousand dollars for this rowing camp and you didn't get any better immediately. The young athletes mind goes to, okay, my parents value, you know, me being better at the sport. And that's the reason they're putting money in. And now I feel pressure rather than support, right? Oftentimes what we see is, is an interesting dialectic or an interesting, um, uh, an interesting collision between you know, parents describing what they're doing as, as support and kids describing that same behavior as pressure, right? So, oh, I mean, I put $5,000 into my kid you know, going to this AAU basketball tournament in Florida. I'm the most supportive parent out there. And meanwhile, the kid is telling us, oh my gosh, my parents spent $5,000 on this trip to Orlando and this basketball tournament. And I just want to play with my friends down the street, like so much pressure on me to do well. So again, back to the idea of we need to align, have conversations around what are our goals? What are our ambitions? How much are we going to dedicate to this as a family in terms of time, money, emotion, energy, um, and, then, and then make sure we're kind of on the same page. So in, in one sentence, wrapping this up, I think it's really important for young people and their parents to constantly, see, at least on a seasonal basis, but every couple of weeks even, having these conversations around what are our goals and how can I help you facilitate that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've got time for one more and it's a, it's a little bit of a different, um, <clears throat> it's a little bit of a, of a different vein um, because, but it's something that although we've become very familiar with in the last uh, 18 months is that with COVID, a lot, a lot of precautions have, a lot of organizations have had to put precautions into, you know, protect athlete coach safety. And I think we're talking from a health standpoint where maybe not letting as many people in the boathouse, not letting as many volunteers and parents, you know, anyone that has, you know, extra exposure for people. So especially if we're heading into another year where we, where we might still have a little bit of that, any suggestions for how to continue to help best leverage parents when they can't maybe actually be in the boathouse. Yeah, row, rowing is, is somewhat fortunate in that it takes place outside. Skiing is the same mm -hmm. way. So there have been restrictions, but at least it's not you know, hockey or basketball or, or something that takes place indoors in the winter. Um, so, so I think, look, we all, we all want to and need to be safe. And, and, and no parent, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this. Um, most parents, I think, are going to be reasonable when it comes to, look, any added layers of protection uh, for, for our young people. And, and look, if, if a club in a given area or context needs to implement certain uh, certain requirements, then, then they need to do that. You, we always need to look out first and foremost. Um, I think this is sort of the, the Hippocratic oath of sports is let's do the least harm to our kids. They, they should be enjoying this experience, growing from this experience. We don't wanna put them in any harm's way. That being said, um, continuing to find ways, maybe thinking outside the box, right? So if it's not in the boathouse, how can they be um, of help? How can they be of help you know, on the, on the water or on the shore or, um, or at home or in transportation, however that looks, um, just continually thinking about, because look, they're not going to go away. Um, and if you put up a wall, they're going to be talking behind that wall to their athletes, to the other parents. Um, so, so, so allowing them and involving them, um, I think is, it remains really important, even in the age of, of COVID and doing so in a safe way. So it was sort of, again, kind of a non-answer, but I think there are ways 
um, at the club level that we can think about these things such that we can we can do both. We can have them be involved, but also you know keep the folks that are in that core unit safe. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think we are going to have to wrap this up. Um, with your permission, Travis, I'd love to put your email in the chat for people. Is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It was on the last slide, and I'm happy to share the slide deck with you as well. Oh, okay. Well, I just I just happened to have it. I just, you know, there it goes in the chat. For if we didn't get to your questions, or if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, and you're looking for some more help, whether you're a coach or an organization that's getting ready for fall, or if you're a parent yourself and you want to you know, support your child in every way possible and learn how to be in those appropriate roles as the mother of a five-year-old about to start rec soccer, I was definitely taking notes about the do's and don'ts uh, for, for a lot of those and what's important. Um, but any final thoughts uh, for the group, Travis, before we get, bid you good night? Man, I'm just, I'm really excited again to be here. Rowing is not a sport that I'm, I'm super familiar with, although I did watch a bunch um, here in the, in the past Olympics. Um, so excited for y'all, excited for your young people's journeys. Um, as a former, I'll call myself elite athlete, as a, as a you know, formal college and, and professional athlete, I'm, uh, I reminisce a lot. And I think you guys are at an awesome stage for, for the coaches, the club leaders, um, and especially the parents and athletes. Enjoy every minute of it keep the, the ultimate goal in mind. And that is that, that we all want a positive experience and positive long-term outcomes for our young people. And uh, just keep being introspective about the way that, that we can achieve that together. So thanks for letting me be here. Great. And then just the final question, and I think if they can email you for this, but if you'd be willing to share the slides. Yes, I absolutely will. Let's connect okay. offline, Brett, and we'll do that. Great. And also this presentation will be posted on uh, U.S. Rowing's website uh, on our webinar section. So coaches, if you want to send this to your parents as, hey, welcome to fall. Watch this presentation. Uh, we'll have that available for you. Thank you, everybody, for spending a wonderful Tuesday evening with us. Um, our next webinar is this Friday with Richard Butler. It's our next diversity, equity, and inclusion webinar specific to college. Um, so tune in for that if you're interested and always be sure to check our nuts and bolts email that goes out um, that will always list all the webinars we have coming up. But Travis, thank you so much for being here with us. And I think we're going to end it right there. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.